This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is sponsored by The Forward. Stay up to date with unlimited access to news, culture, and opinion all through a Jewish lens. And for our listeners, for 2NJB listeners, get six months of The Forward for 15 bucks. An exclusive subscription offer for our listeners, forward.com slash 2NJB, and get six months for 15 bucks. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. And last but not least, in collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. Let's talk about your underpants. The undies you're wearing right now were most likely not manufactured in your home country. Chances are they were made in China or Malaysia or Taiwan, thousands and thousands of kilometers away by a kid who's paid a fraction of what you make in an hour. Then, with the click of a button, the undies you're wearing traveled across the globe and landed on your doorstep. And that's just undies. Information travels infinitely faster. This, in a nutshell, is the story of globalization, the incredible historic process that has connected our planet in an unprecedented way, and which is now under attack, at least according to Nadav Eyal. Nadav Eyal is a renowned Israeli journalist. He's currently a columnist for Yediot Acharonot newspaper. Until recently, he was the head of the foreign desk at Channel 13 News, and before that, he was on the political beat for various outlets, including Ma'ariv and Galei Tzal. His new book, Revolt, The Worldwide Uprise Against Globalization, depicts the major undercurrents that he believes might threaten modern civilization. We are thrilled to be joined by Nadav Eyal to discuss his new book, as well as a subject he's been covering thoroughly for over a year, the battle against COVID. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm, I'm so happy to be here this morning. Thank you. It's a so, rainy morning in Tel Aviv. Yeah. <laughs> Not an easy morning to be here. So for those of you guys watching us, you can see the book here on uh, on video, Revolt, the Worldwide Uprising Against Globalization. I'm assuming you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it everywhere right the now. The Book Depository, yes. yeah, wherever you get your books, check it out. Mm -hmm. And before we get started, uh, this episode is sponsored by Masa Israel Journey. Guys, if you're listening, you probably have some interest in Israel. Well, Masai Israel Journey is a marketplace for long-term opportunities in Israel. You can explore your career path. You can live out your passions. You can make a positive impact on the world. All right. During the pandemic, Masa also created options to study and work remotely from Israel. You don't need to pause your life. You don't need to know Hebrew. But if you apply and you get accepted, you get funding. So learn more at MasaIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys. That's spelled out Two Nice Jewish Boys. To let them know that we sent you MasaIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys. Got to check it out. Okay, so where do we start? The book. The book. Why did you decide to write this book? I didn't really decide to write it. I returned back from the U.S. And, and during my time in the U.S., I'm talking about right after Trump was elected. So I was returning from this huge shock of uh, the 2016 elections. And I started just, you know, scribbling stuff about my recollections. And the minute I came back, I was offered a book deal. I was offered two. Uh, because it was such a huge event and I was covering it for a while. But then I understood that just writing a book about Trump winning wouldn't be A, enough. And B, it, it's not really what I... It's not what I gather after more than a decade of covering international sphere and talking with nationalists and racists and one of the things that I think I saw was that Trump is just I write in the book he's just the beginning of something he's uh, you know a symptom and you need to take the long the long look here and understand that it's a mosaic of happenings uh, that are really occurring everywhere right now and are connected to a wider phenomena, which I describe in the book, and I label revolt, for lack of a better name. So 
basically there's this worldwide uprising against this phenomenon uh, of globalization. Can you kind of give us the rundown of globalization as you see it? So basically globalization is the deepening and some would say, you know, uh, the uh, not only the deepening, but also the, the extensive nature of interdependence and interconnectedness between people, communities, economies, cultures, and, and there are a lot of definitions. But I use the label globalization. Usually it's used more in the, on the economic side, but I use it to describe a, an uprising against power structures. So sometimes I think about, <laughs> you know, uh, the uprising against globalization, and, and I think it's not accurate enough because it's not wide enough. People are resisting power structures today almost everywhere because they see them as corrupt, hollow, unresponsive to their needs, just not relevant anymore. And you see it everywhere. Sometimes their revolt might manifest itself with a resistance and a sort of uh, a demand, a resolved demand for more democracy. And sometimes they are resisting you know, liberal values, progressive values. And sometimes they are resisting, they are revolting because they fear extinction because of the biodiversity crisis or the climate crisis. And sometimes it's, it's other things. Now, sometimes when I say that, for instance, I read a really horrible review in a sort of an, an amnesty or an NGO kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's a sort of PDF. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, on the, on the book. The things that they're the best at putting out. Yes. <laughs> PDFs. Yeah. So, so it was attacking the book because basically it was saying, you know, how do you compare between people who are demanding that we keep our biodiversity and also you're putting in the same basket uh, the deplorables, mainly the neo-Nazis, the, the truly deplorables, yeah, uh, the neo-Nazis and the fascists you speak with and you say they are all revolting. You know, isn't this oversimplifying? And, and, and basically, they were offended that I would put, you know, the humanist nature of people who want to make this world better, and I believe that they are trying to make this better, together with ultranationalists or even fundamentalists. And my answer is that this is not a normative judgment. I am not trying to say it's the same. I am not comparing the grievances of people or the actions. I'm not justifying the anarchists who are, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails in Athens, and I speak with them during the book while they are preparing the Molotov uh, cocktails, and I don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> but, but, you know, only afterwards I'm sort of processing and understanding. Yes, they they were actually preparing cocktail, um, you know, Molotov cocktails, and I, I'm not justifying this, and I'm not comparing this. But what I'm saying is that for people power structures have become so irrelevant and they they feel an urge to replace and to append them and i think we feel that we sense this really everywhere and sometimes it's defund the police i i don't think we should defund the police but when i hear defund the police i'm saying oh something healthy is happening in our societies in the sense that People are rethinking these structures and we really should be rethinking these structures because when they were built, it was a different world and we're living in a different condition today. And we should be rethinking these structures before the Chinese would be doing that or before fundamentalists would be doing that or neo-Nazis would be doing that. And they will be, you know, uh, the front line of modernity and of uh, contemporary life. And this already happened, of course, in the 1920s and 1930s, when people thought that democracies are really f far behind and the most advanced regimes are those who will use modern techniques like propaganda, cinema and others in order to amplify their messages. So we have been there before, liberals, I mean. Liberals from all sides of the picture. So my book is very... It's very much not, you know, it's not, it's not a Marxist, although some would think because of the revolt title. It's not yeah. a Marxist pamphlet on, on the one hand. And it's also not a, definitely not a libertarian kind of right-wing capitalist call. What it tries to do is to accept that it's a dialectic nature and that globalization is a dialectic process. And it has both darkness and light within it.
can you give us an example of a story from the book which to you is can explain this the best uh, I think I I really open up with a story about that Pakistani newspaper that gets burned you know not exactly gets burned down but <laughs> gets taken over by a gang of fundamentalists uh, so the story is about a friend of mine Amara Durani which I'm, I'm these days I'm trying to send her the book to To Pakistan from Israel and <laughs> it turns out it's more of a problem than I thought initially uh, because the two countries don't have uh, diplomatic relations and we met on a seminar funded by the US State Department which is of course an example of the world order in which we live uh, you have the superpower and this superpower has an, an intention to bring people together under the, the issue under the the aura of Of its liberal order and so it brings those warring tribes those Pakistani and Israelis and also in the same center of Palestinians and Indians and we all together in the same room and we kept uh, contact afterwards and then she or during our conversation she talked about you know interviewing the Prime Minister which was back then the late Ariel Sharon and I said you're not gonna get Sharon uh, but you 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 will get Shimon Peres and she said of course that's that's even better and and, and Peres was at the time uh, at the Sharon government and we we interviewed him there was no line there was no phone line connection I think it was 2004 2005 I write about it in the book and there was no phone line connection and we couldn't do it like we do it to, today with zoom. Or even I don't think that there was Skype or we weren't you know we didn't know that there were, was Skype so basically what happened is that she sent me by email her questions I convinced Paris to do it I didn't need much convincing to do Paris was always you know oh yes you know interviewing to uh, Pakistani biggest in Pakistani newspaper this was the news of uh, world news or news of the world and Pakistani news, news. I think news international news international right, right. Yeah. yeah it's the biggest kind of English speaking Pakistani media group it's huge it, it uh, I think it's the same as the junk which is the biggest newspaper anyway so he said yes and she sent the questions and I interviewed him and he of course called for a diplomatic relations between Pakistan and Israel and he said that uh, Pakistan might have a place in the negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians and And this was classic Paris and she published it it was a front page story and it was after she did several stories about the relations the Kalenstein relations between Pakistan and Israel and uh, the day after uh, about a dozen or more on people so with a militia a fundamentalist militia broke into the offices of the newspaper and beat some people up and and also set the place to Uh, you know was set she, fire was she there no she wasn't there and it was at night mainly the guards were there so no real journalist this was a message and the message is you published an interview with an Israeli official highest official for the first time in Pakistani history calling for diplomatic relations and we're, we're not gonna live with that and I think that story sim- symbolizes and I write about this in the book and many things first of all of course the superpower operating here in order to bring people together under the liberal order then the idea of sort of a, a progressive notion a universalist notion we can get over our differences which are mainly what I mean the history culture tradition an analysis or perception of religion I might not agree with and then this call for peace and for relations then come up the fundamentalists and That would say we will not let this be we, we will revolt against your liberal progressive notions you met you know in a seminar somewhere in Boston was probably great for you but it's a threat for us and we'll, we'll fight this so this is an example of, re, of a really reactionary aspect of the revolt the revolt doesn't need to be so reactionary and dark and so obvious so to speak but But, but it is a notion of the revolt because on the other hand I you know I could bring a much simpler story somewhere today in India or in Israel in Pakistan or in the US a child reads or sees you know an example or listens to music that basically gives them the message that love 
triumphs everything and every traditional or religious difference. And this is a narrative of the Western civilization, probably before Romeo and Juliet. The idea that you should get over and, you know, family differences, tribal differences, religion, because love is more important. And this was sort of replicated again and again, Hollywood and many other places. And then that child goes back to, to her uh, father or to her mother and says, I'll marry whoever I think, you know, I love. Then he and, kills her. And, and Yeah. Oh, well, and then something yeah. happens and then there's, there is conflict. Yeah. That's a classic story. Um, and that's, that's a story happening everywhere in the world today uh, because it's uh, traditional values. Or, and, and, and I, really, I don't think the people who say, you know, I want my children, my children are Jewish. I want them to marry Jewish. I know that many people who listen right now probably have these kind of, of parents or think that. And I don't think that this is necessarily racist. I don't think that this is... And I think that one of the things that, that happened is that during the conversation within the, the liberal order that we have built, we didn't understand that people can make these choices. For instance, Jews can choose to marry you know, people who are Jewish and not be considered uh, racist. And parents could want their children to marry within their religion and would not be uh, considered racist. You can choose racist. to be conservative. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, one of the things that the, the book does uh, is that I, I gave an interview to, uh, I, I don't remember uh, uh, to, uh, if it was to Yedi when the book came out. And, and I said, you know, that the book might be deemed conservative to an extent, but it's, it's not conservative. It's, it's a liberal conservative uh, perception. And we're, we're a dying breed, of course, but the idea that, I'll give you an example, okay? You can justify privacy as a right, and you can justify privacy because it's none of my damn business. So a conservative would say, you know, a, a liberal would say, I have a right for privacy. I was born with a right for privacy. Privacy is the where I can go and grow as a human being. And a conservative would say, you have a right to privacy because it's none of my damn business what you're doing. And I'm not saying conservative means using damn a lot. <laughs> okay. I'm just Although saying. It does. And I'm saying, you know, it, it means that I have no interest in what you are doing. And I have no, uh, I don't want to use the, the, the term right, but I, I don't need to shove my nose into your business. It's almost like you'd. I, it's not that I have a right to privacy, but you don't have a right to my privacy. Mm. It's uh, it's the 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 right dialogue or rhetoric has entered so heavily into our discussion that we three people cannot even not use the word right when we want to describe this. But what we're talking about is decency. Mm -hmm. What we're really talking about is decency. And what I write in the end of the book is that there is a lot of power in doing stuff not because we're using normative arguments in terms of rights, but we're saying it's the right thing to do. It's not the right, but the right thing to do um, because it's not done, because it's fair play, because of all these ideas of decency. And you might remember that one of the uh, rejections of empire uh, when the British decided to be empire, was by Burke, of course, which is the founder of conservative thinking to an extent. So Burke wasn't not only not enthusiastic about empire, but actually rejected it. And he rejected empire not because he was thinking about other people. He was rejecting empire first and foremost because he saw that it's changing his own society. So, uh, you know, what the book does is it, it says there is a liberal mainstream, not in the sense of liberals as a curse that they use it for left-wingers in the US, but a liberal mainstream, both right and left, and we can live together and we can, uh, you know, interact together because we have growing enemies from within this discussion. And these enemies will not, for instance, ask questions about economy, uh, you know, should we protect local production or shouldn't we? This is a really rational 
discussion. Someone can win the discussion and someone can lose it. Clinton and, and, and Bush tried, for instance, to, to do that, and they, they failed. So Paul Krugman and others will say, and Stiglitz will say, you know, we tried to protect local production, it failed, and it led to us, you know, losing more jobs. So it's a rational discussion. Uh, our problem is that more and more discussions with our, in our societies do not sit within the realm of a liberal interaction, which is rational anymore. If we go back to the Pakistani journalist story, to me, what I hear, maybe I'm immediately taking it to the political side, but I hear a battle between values, like the, the battle between those who want to be free and those who want to use uh, violence uh, to, to prevent freedom from others, mm-hmm. essentially. And so, so is that, in essence, the problem we're facing? Can, can't you divide the world into those two groups? And no, I, I don't think so, because um, those who want to defund the police because they feel the police is, is hollow and racist, in many places it is, um, what do they want? They also want to be free. Uh, they want to be free of, of that structures. Uh, we, from these structures which they see as, as enemies. Are they mistaken? Some could argue they are. I'm, I'm not sure I can judge from my position as a white privileged male. Um, I, I, should we not use, you know, should I not use this kind of uh, rhetoric or this kind of uh, uh, understanding? I, I, I think I should. I'm, I'm fully aware to who I am. So no, it's not about only being free. It's about being recognized. It's about being threatened. It's about people really sensing that they cannot maintain their way of life. And this revolt has a lot to do with technology, with us sitting here recording a podcast, which will be heard everywhere in the world. And it's a lot to do with the world becoming more and more global. I, I talk about a consciousness which is global. So some of the things that happen in the world is that people can converse more thoroughly coming from different places. They have more shared memories. They have more share, shared images of 9-11, of Donald Trump, of We're Paul. Friends. Of, of, Okay, <laughs> unfortunately, up. yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, of, of, uh, Ross and Rachel. Yeah, I, I was thinking of, of porn. <laughs> okay. Which I think is even more, you know, so they have these images together. And if you sit down, a 20-year-old from, from India, urban area, with a 20-year-old from somewhere else, they'll have a lot to converse, a lot more to converse than they did. Those are all Western... concepts of what no i mean 9-11 donald trump and yes. even porn it's all western you know the most of those common images are western and have western values yeah but there's surra- non-western ones right tiananmen square or, i don't know the great wall of china like there's, there's yeah no but i agree i i agree that there is something uh, you know Yeah, th- this is the civilization in which we live and in urban areas around the world this is what rules Uh, but um, is it for instance anime okay mm-hmm. uh, which is growing I, I always look at Japan because Japan is so good and uh, so the West always goes at Japan hmm they're so crazy and then they go and do it uh, and that that's that's so true about TV it's true about technology and if you look at Japan and the way that anime has really entered I'm not talking even on manga or all these things but But the idea of animation for grown-ups, uh, this is a Japanese thing. This is a Japanese phenomenon that has entered our uh, Western civilization. So, yeah. But only because J- Japan decided to play the game and decided or forced upon, I don't know, and become westernized, right? To an extent. Uh, I, I don't know what's westernized. You know, when, when I visit Japan or... You know of China even the open I, I feel that I in a different I'm in the different civilization altogether uh, codes are really very different it's very uh, you know you don't understand for instance when uh, you sit in a meeting and the other side laughs you know it's not the same laugh as it is when you are in New York right so you need to understand that um, 
so it's emerging. It's emerging. And of course, it's Western influenced, infused by the West, but it's emerging. And what we're seeing is more memories and more, and that means more consciousness. And then we see that stuff is changing. One of the examples I bring in the book, which usually is never brought in a book about globalization, is fertility. Fertility is dropping everywhere. And, and Caldwell, which is probably was the late Caldwell, uh, probably the most renowned demographer uh, at the time, said this is because of forces that are global, that are operating everywhere on the population. And these forces are globalization. And he said this is the first time in history that we're seeing a synchronized drop in fertility everywhere. And this is, you know, he saw that years and years ago, much before Elon Musk started saying, uh, this, is the, this is the crisis that we're entering. So we, we need to understand that our national structures, our local structures, they're sometimes speaking as though they have control of our lives and they can influence our lives. But they are only playing the game. It's a facade, right? Because our prime minister, yeah, he can do all kinds of stuff, but this is a pandemic. It's global. And unless he, of course, shuts everything out and builds a big wall or is Huge in an wall. island, you know, has an ocean around him, then it's a problem. And one of the things that, and this is, you know, a pandemic is even a simpler example than economy. Interest rates. Interest rates is probably one of the best ways that a country has in order to control and regulate, fis, you know, uh, monetarily and then fiscally its economy. And we can't lower our interest rate much more. First of all, no one can right now because they're approaching zero. But we can decide tomorrow morning that, oh, the Israeli economy is just looking great and we're going to have 5% or 4% interest rates in this country. I if mean, we you do that, can. But you can, but the, the economy will crash immediately. It will be deemed, you know, it would be, uh, the, the, the government doing that will fall in a day because everything will crash here in a day. It will first, if you have higher interest rate, first you will have an inflation of money coming from outside the country, then the bubble will burst. It will be terrible. There is a reason we don't do that. There is a reason that no industrial Western country has such a different interest rate than the American one. And the reason is that we live in a global economy. And the truth is that even the Americans don't e control it anymore. If you look at the euro dollar market, they cannot really control that either. So our leaders can say loads of things, but if tomorrow morning I you know, increase taxes in this country substantially, because I'm living on the far outposts of the American empire, the meaning of that is that I will have a capital plight you know, immediately. Uh, All the Israelis with the European citizenship. Of course, you know. And, will flee. And again, the you know, if I do this substantially, the economy will crash. So they have sort of a, a bandwidth in which they can actually make decisions. It's really limited, and it's becoming more and more limited by the reality that is global. And then one of the things that have, that, that's happening, and I write about that uh, relating to Greece, is that politicians now tend to rotate to gravitate, sorry, towards the cultural, towards the religious or the traditional, because actually the big decisions are made for them. And these are mainly economy and sometimes politics. So they can't really make these decisions. So they will have a battle, for instance, in Greece with Macedonia. So it will be called Northern Macedonia. Instead of saying, oh, we have a problem because the European troika is crushing our society and leading to higher poverty rates than we have ever seen in modern Greece since the Civil War. No, 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 no. Let's have a battle here about the name of Macedonia. And all the newspapers will be dealing with that. So this gravitation towards cultural, first of all, it serves the right, the populist right. And secondly, it only goes to manifest and demonstrate how people are not really in control through our, their local power structures, 
on their life, but the local power structures, which are so full of themselves, want to uh, give the impression that they're still in control, and they are not. But isn't this some, in in a way, an attack on uh, you know, like the Keynesian fiscal and monetary policies, where governments try and stimulate and influence the economy? Because what you're saying is the economy is this is this behemoth, this like massive engine that can't really be steered one way or another by the the whims of some government raising or lowering the interest rates. In the end, it's gonna straighten itself out so best to get out of the way I, first of all you, you know it governments can but it will have repercussions and the best example is of course trump if you think about what trump promised to do and what he really did there are a lot of things that he promised and he did uh you know follow up mainly on the international sphere vis-a-vis -vis Israel, because he didn't have to pay a price for moving the embassy, for instance. So it was just easy for him to do. Or building a wall. He just decided to build the wall, and then he issued these addicts. And I was at the wall, and everybody knows that he didn't build, you know, he didn't build much of it. And the Biden administration is probably not going to continue that. But he did promise to save coal. And I was there. And I describe this. There's a family of coal miners that I follow up during these years in the book. The Quigley family from Mariana, Pennsylvania. And the, the Quigleys did return. You know, he, the Joe Jr. was fired. Uh, and then he did find work during the Trump administration as a coal miner again. Great. But it wasn't because of Trump. And coal... Plants all across the U.S. continued to close. And coal mines could close. So Trump couldn't really save coal. What he could do is to lower taxes on the rich, which he did. And the stock market went crazy with that. So there is stuff that they can do. I'm not saying that there isn't. And also, you can always spend more money if everybody else does. And that's what's happening today in the world. Still, those who are giving the cues are in the U.S. So if the U.S., if the message coming from the U.S. is protectionist, you see this reverberating around the world, and it did during Trump. Now and during Trump, the message is this is a pandemic, and nobody is talking about crunch. Nobody is talking about going into a fiscal kind of <coughs> environment. Everybody is talking about Keynesian uh, economy, and I don't even know really right-wing economists right now saying it's not the way to go. So it's very mainstream. Uh, in the end, if you want to control it, if you want really to control it, you you can do that. And the example of is, of course, the subprime crisis and the fact that we stayed on really very limited interest rates, very low interest rates since then, and we... we we don't have any tools anymore. So we will go boom and bust, boom and bust again and again and again, because this is the economy that, that's been built. And to this, you've got crypto coming in. You've got many, many Dogecoin. elements. Dogecoin. And, and, and everybody, no, nobody's talking about this yet. But, but of course, the Chinese digital coin. Nobody's mm. talking about that. Nobody's seeing that. But the Chinese are really serious. And this is, by the way, this is not a blockchain. Uh, not entirely. Of course not, because you cannot control. Exactly, exactly. No, no, this is not a blockchain thing. So uh, we're seeing the, the idea that there is a leader to this liberal order. It was built by someone. There's an architect. The architect probably sits like in the Matrix, you know, in Washington. So they built it. But then they lost control of it. They cannot control it anymore. It's just too big. Nobody can really do that. But can, you can still have policies within it. You just can't when you're a small country like israel or even sweden or belgium say i'm part of globalization and i'm also running the show in this country it's simply impossible it's not true that's that's all i'm saying i'm not saying that you can't have you know within this bandwidth you can't have better policies or worse policies but it's rather limited 
And, the, the, you know, you're thinking that your prime minister makes a lot of decisions that are really crucial in most places in the world. It's just not true anymore. But in China, you can, if you're the leader of China, you can decide where to draw the line, right? Mm -hmm. With internet, with economy, whatever you want. It's a, it's a question. To what extent can you limit the distribution of ideas? Uh, I bring a conversation in the book with a Chinese friend of mine, and I say to him that she, uh, Chairman Xi, is the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Of course she is much more powerful than Mao. I say, how, how, you know, how is that possible? And he says, Mao didn't know what everyone thinks. And she does. But does the fact that he knows what everybody thinks because he controls the social networks and because China is really having the most sophisticated, uh, you know, technology-based info and data apparatus on its own citizens, does it say that they can limit ideas? The, the example that I bring in the book is the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia that uh, of course, in Tunisia, it's not called the, the Jasmine Revolution. This is the way that it was defined by the Western media. It's called the Dignity Revolution in Arabic. And then after this spring, this was the beginning of the Arab Spring, began, the Chinese saw that Jasmine became code in their own networks for democracy. So they had to ban you know, the use of Jasmine <laughs> on WeChat and other platforms. And they also uh, took down songs from YouTube, a famous Chinese song with the word Jasmine. And they also started to limit the sale of Jasmine flowers. And what you see here is really the construct of a global consciousness. Can it be prevented? Can we withdraw into the dark? The answer is yes. To, to your comment. And this is what the book is saying. The book is, is saying, uh, in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, that it's about progress. There's no problem with people revolting. Uh, I think that the revolt is healthy. I think it could, we can use the revolt in order to have a more sustainable world order. Like we saw you know, with GameStop, for example. With many things, you know. With, uh, th there is something truly healthy about people saying, why do we need this power structure there? Okay, let's think about it. You, you can say it's healthy because you're a libertarian. I can say it's healthy because I'm a progressive. We should rethink and recalibrate our structures according to technology. It's really healthy for people to say, why shouldn't we have a direct democracy if we, everybody has a smartphone? Maybe we should have that. Maybe that would be better. People should be demonstrating and protesting. It's much more healthy for them to be in the streets protesting for their own needs than being in their houses saying everything is lost and I'm, you know, a complete cynic. That's, that energy of the revolt can serve in order to, to solve, you know, parts of the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, having a tax regime in which the super, the uber rich are not simply exempt from paying taxes, unlike, you know, me and you. We, we can use that, but the problem is that the revolt is being used by either regimes or groups in order to organize an uprising against the notions of progress and enlightenment. So this is what it's being channeled into. And we're seeing this with the pandemic right now, which I know you want to speak to about too. Yeah. So you're really seeing how something which is the mistrust, distrust of institutions, for instance, in Israel, the distrust of the prime minister is becoming, let, let's deny reality and let's object sometimes on the fringe elements of the uh, radical left wing. Let's object to vaccination because the prime minister has brought these vaccines and because we, we, we distrust him. This is generally happening in many places. So you always have fundamentalists and anti-vaxxers and charlatans and you know, professional liars. You always have those guys around. And they're, they're usually fringe. But 
the question is, when do they enter mainstream? And their entry to mainstream is through the sentiment of the revolt. Everything, all power structures are hollow and corrupt. Then comes a guy and says, you know, I've said it for 50 years now. And Islam is the answer. And that's what the Muslim Brotherhood has been saying for more than, you know, 100 years. But now they're saying, you know, come to us. You are revolting because you understand. No, they are not revolting because they want to reject, a, you know, 50-inch TV screens. They're not revolting because they don't want their children to study in Stanford. Everybody wants their children to go to Stanford. Uh, that's not the reason 95%, you know, uh, of those revolting feel that way, or those minors in Pennsylvania. No, they don't like Trump. They didn't believe Trump. They understood that he's really problematic. But they wanted to append the structure in which, like they said to me, our children are as smart as children in California. But nobody's building an Intel plant here or on, on the Appalachian. Nobody's building this. So what are they supposed to do? So they came to that consciousness. So you're saying basically that fundamentalists are leveraging the grievances of the of of normal people who are simply suffering maybe the uh, the aftermath or not the aftermath but the uh, the so the consequences and the shockwaves of globalization. So fundamentalists are leveraging and taking advantage of these people in order to pull them into the extreme and then destabilize. Yes, but this is, um, I, I hope that my observation is, is, is less, less obvious in that sense. Because it's, it's obvious, fundamentalists always talk to grievances. But one of the things that I say is that usually liberals and mainly, I would say, you know, progressive politics, which is infused by materialism, by the Marxist concept of materialism, uh, would say the reason people turn to fundamentalism or the reason that fundamentalism operates, it, it's always about ignorance and about wages. No, 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 no. So the book says, no, it's, it's about meaning. Fundamentalism is a detailed attack against notions of enlightenment and it's part of modernity. Fundamentalists want to present themselves as people who came you know, and stayed the same like Abraham. <laughs> They're not, right? There are, they are an invention of the modern age. And they have a project here. And the project for fundamentalists, as is the project for nationalists, and it's by no mistake that nationalists, I'm talking about ethnic nationalists, uh, use fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, and Islamic fundamentalists use ethnic nationalists. And their project is the same project. They want to have progressive liberals, or liberals at all, both right-wing conservatives, and left-wingers, they want them in enclaves. They want them, I write in the book, like those tribes in the Amazon, you know, that you see from above, and they will have their enclaves sometimes, you know, in, you know with this metaphor in, in urban areas, and they'll be shooting arrows at the helicopters, um, while those people in the helicopters with the power will be the Marine Le Pen of the world, but also the fundamentalists, you know, that we've seen trying to rise through the, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a good example because it was a liberal demand by liberals, by liberals. Uh, that was he, hijacked. What, what, at a certain point, it was hijacked by, by Islamists that, you know, are really far away from these notions. So to, to, specifically to your question, it's not only about fundamentalism and the thing is that really the world order is not sustainable. And if we don't start really you know, talking about it and changing it, then and really acknowledging the revolt and understanding why people are revolting and sympathize with those who revolt, and I do, um, not generally speaking, not with everyone, of course, but with those middle classes, then we'll find ourselves in a place in which it will be hijacked again and again and again by people who will use it in order to destroy progress. And societies will go back into the dark. They will turn back irrationally to the dark and to poverty and to war. And it will happen if we will not fight for it. And the way to fight for it is not by status quo. 
is 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 by I think because I'm a progressive is by always looking forward in order to 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 find the place in, of change. Some say now I'm segu- in a segue to COVID. Some say it is happening right now because you say that governments have not much power, but here we see in the age of p- pandemic that governments took complete control over people's lives in democracies. It's it, using tactics and tools that were implemented first in China in a dictatorship. And so what do you make of that? How, how is it possible? You said that in globalization, uh, governments have no no power, but here they to control complete control over our lives. So how do you explain that? First of all, we're in the middle of an emergency. And in in pandemics, a uh, locality is important. Your mayor is suddenly important. Uh, your kindergarten, the supermarket you go to, because you can't go any further, right? And for many people, saying that locality is really suddenly important in this global world is really reassuring because they feel safer. <laughs> well, not for most people. So I, if I would, you would come to most people and I would say, you know, it's either your locality will take care of it or it will be, you know, some institutional, international organization that really understands and it doesn't take into account the narrow political needs of the Netanyahu government, many people would say, I would take the professionals any day. So locality is a comfort only when you trust that locality. And one of the things that I, I've seen, for instance, is polls and studies about the level of trust in countries across Europe. Of course, when the level of trust was high, when the pandemic started, it remained high and even became higher. I'm talking on Scandinavian countries mainly, but not only. But when the distrust was high to begin with, uh, the pandemic only made it worse. So in many places, the political systems uh, are broken, but it would be a stupid generalization of me to say that it's broken everywhere. Uh, many places that people are really happy with the decisions that governments have made. For instance, New Zealand, Taiwan, you know, people acknowledge that their government made the right decision. But if you look at the Western world, like Europe and the United most States and Canada... No, most, people, most people do not. Most people yeah. think it's, it's a terrible failure. And I think that when history writes down what has happened in the COVID era, it would say that science and scientists rose to the moment and they had this incredible operation of having more studies out, understanding the virus better, but also having vaccines in enormous speed. But it was a politics, our politics, that failed everywhere, almost everywhere, and has exposed itself to be hollow and defective and unresponsive to people's needs and simply not suitable, not suitable to deal with these challenges. And in order not to be, you know, on a a too general note, the best example is, of course, the way that China was handled to begin with. This is international politics and not local politics. But basically, you know, if you have a global village here and we've been all told that it's a global village and we can go to the Ben Gurion airport and we can buy a ticket from here, you know, immediately and everything. It's a global village. And at the end of the village, there's a house, a big red house. And people from that house continue to draw water from the well in the center of the village. But one day there is a disease spreading in that house. And you don't have any international body that can knock on the door and say, hey, guys, we want to help you, or we want to know what, what is that disease and where exactly that it, it comes from. And the only way to enter that house is basically by coming to the Chinese Communist uh, Party and just, uh, <laughs> you know, just asking really nicely and waiting for six months. Then we have a problem. It's not a global village. It's not a global village. It's just a bunch of houses there. And it's a threat because in a global world, local crisis is never local anymore. We saw that with a subprime crisis 
We saw that with the Syrian civil war. Syria is not an important country. And the meaning of Syria for the politics of Brexit, for the politics of Trump, was so crucial. And now we're seeing this with, with a pandemic. And in all of these cases, we needed international bodies that at least would be able to gather information and will have some sort of a supranational authority. And we don't have those. And the reason we don't have those is because those local politicians would not give them that power because this would threaten them. And sometimes local societies would not want that because they feel threatened by those supranational bodies. And one of these, the problems here is that there is no sustainable story to tell about globalization that people would support. So politicians everywhere can't go on a campaign trail and say, oh, I'm from, I, I am for supranational bodies and expect to draw a lot of votes. I'm not saying that they never do that. Macron tried to do that. Hillary Clinton tried to do that, talking very positively about globalization. But it doesn't have soldiers. You know, there is no credible narrative because the narrative is either it's a global village. We're going to all sit down and sing Kumbaya together. And nobody believes that. This is the 1990s. It's great. You know, uh, it's the end of history. Everything's just going to be dandy. And, you know, poverty rates are going to go down. They did go down. But inequality in many places went up. And it's really important for how people feel and on the other hand, the other story told by, I don't know, you know, the, what was once labeled the Chicago school is that it's all supply and demand. Guys, it's all supply and demand, and that will make your life better. So one narrative is completely false, and that's the narrative of the Kumbaya global village. It do, simply it doesn't exist. And the other narrative is a narrative no one will vote for even as an, an observation could be true, but nobody's going to vote for, oh, yeah, you're living in an engine of supply and demand, and you're the fuel. But what you're talking about, Ethan, do you want to... No, no, go but ahead. <laughs> Today you're the spectator. Yeah. It's too early for you. <laughs> what, you're, what you're talking about, I, I would interpret as policing, a world police that can pol police countries like China or, or Russia. But what it will lead to... Well, why do you think it, it's not going to uh, police the US? But go ahead. Because it's, it's yeah. not a coincidence that the pandemic started with China. No, I think, I think that if the pandemic would have started in the US during the Trump years, <clears throat> I, I have to tell you that I don't know what would have been worse. I don't know. Because I, the, the Chinese um, bought the world a lot of time by employing really a, a lockdown that in the US would be simply unfathomable. But they hid, they hid, first they hid information. Yes, Until uh, now they hide information. I, I, I completely agree, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. But if I want to be a realist about that, if it would have happened in the US, it would have spread to the US and to the world much more quickly. And we know that simply because of the air travel and the fact that no one would say, oh, I have 200 uh, cases of a respiratory disease in California and I'm going to close down the country and tell everyone, do not leave your house for four months. And this but is what they did in, in a 10 million city, you know, for th three and a half months, I, I, uh, called Wuhan. So it, it would have been even worse. But when you want to form this global body that will take care of things no no i don't uh, think or, I, I, or, I don't I, i'm not saying that we need you know a i'm not um preaching here for full-scale global government this no, is not but my agenda. let's say an upgraded un or whatever no, let, you let's say call no let, let's be very specific let's say the who mm -hmm. has the right to say to a country i'm entering the country within right. 24 hours right but 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 that's no, that, the that's thing it. do you think that this is that this is too much for our world no but the thing is it's West, impractical in a western way. countries countries would probably uh, co cooperate but totalitarian dark countries like russia or china would not, and what you're talking about would lead to a, a cold war, which we're already at a, a, on a certain level. But For, but it will just bring uh, the, the cold war, and where would that leave us? It will leave us with two nations, like the again the two values, two I, I different value I, sets. Look, after World War Two, we build institutions, 
uh, I call it, I label this the era of responsibility in the book, in the beginning of the book. And I say about that era that you need to know two things about it. This was the era of people who actually saw the world burn down. And the most important thing about that era is that they had specific and subjective memories, not memories in history books, their own memory of a world burning down. So they built a world and an order, both East and West, based on a rational discourse, based on global cooperation, both East and West, in communist countries, in Western countries, capitalists, they talked about the same values. They just said that their interpretation for the good life, the Aristotelian good life, is better. So Marxists, communists, and capitalists, they argued who would give people the good life. And that's a good argument. That's a really good argument to make. Uh, and that was the Cold War. And the institutions built after the war were really aimed at not allowing countries to go on uh, an occupation spree of the terms, you know, of the blitzkrieg uh, that we saw with uh, Nazi Germany. Now, our world today has different that challenges. And in order to sustain that these challenges, to sustain any order, we will need to have bodies with some international, some more international authority. Not seeing that is irrational. You are absolutely right to detect that most who resist that would be, you know, dark, darker countries uh, in their regimes. But I'm not so certain. Uh, think about the criminal court, the International Criminal Court. I do think it's politicized. I do think it's problematic to an extent. But the idea is a good idea. Is it? Yes, I mean I it doesn't. So, yeah. It doesn't have any. Uh, to the point about the WHO as well. There's no jurisdiction. There's no. There's nothing practical about it because it can't do anything. So a country says no. What is it going to do? No, but if if it's a signatory to the Rome, <coughs> uh, to the Rome Treaty, uh, no, it can't say no. Meaning other countries. No, they, they, it's a club of countries that that agree between them yeah. voluntarily. Voluntarily that, you know, that the, that the International Criminal Court, the ICC, has jurisdiction. And for many countries uh, that we don't think about, this solves a lot of problems. We saw that, for instance, in the tribunals about crimes uh, relating to crimes uh, against humanity or war crimes in Africa. Some countries didn't want to have, you know, the, the courts held in their own country according to their own law because of political pressures and otherwise. But the idea that there are crimes that go beyond your local law, beyond your politics, and are international, are a recollection of World War II. But there, it's in the end of the day, it's a representation of the current world order. And so, I mean, it, it's nothing if it's not simply uh, uh, upheld by the powers that be, right? So, I mean, it's it's... The U.S. is going to hold the most power in whatever it is, in whatever structure it is, uh, and and probably most Western nations. This is one of the this is one of the things that we need to correct. Look, we cannot have a Security Council with five permanent members, including France and the U.K. Why, you know, France? With all due respect to France and the U.K. and their contribution to Western civilization, and I'm very inclined towards the UK. I was born there. You can't hear. Uh, I, 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 and I studied there, and I lived there. But, uh, you know, what about, and could we have, please, you know, an African country in the Security Council? Isn't but it, it's not going to happen. No, it is going to happen. It is going to happen because this world order is crumbling. It's disastrous. But then you see, like, it's the, not representative. It will collapse. Like the the only rights. question is, will it collapse? Will it collapse by us doing that in a measured way and bringing this reform, or it will collapse after it, be, it will become so irrelevant that we'll see a catastrophe? But but I mean, how will it collapse by by uh, Africans gather, you know, coming together, invading and, Europe and, and taking and, control? And, of no, it? but no. seriously. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the people at the, you know, on the ground 
firing arrows at the helicopter. I mean, that's what it'll look like. Mm. I mean, how are, how are we going to upend? In the end, there's a power structure that exists because the, there, there is power at the top. Um, oh, that's, that's a, a good remark. Um, many power structures do not exist because there's power at the top or from the bottom up. If the power is really only on the to at the top, and it's a top-down kind of power structures, it, it will collapse uh, because it needs to have legitimacy. Power structures in societies live by legitimacy. We don't have enough police officers, really, uh, if, if nobody gives them the, legitimate, uh, the legitimacy of employing force, uh, you know, everything will collapse. And to the question, I, if I was uh, a young uh, African leader, uh, which of course I'm not, I'm a, a not yet, white privileged uh, <laughs> male uh, from, from Israel, um, I would uh, probably say, you know, guys, you have this body called the UN, you have a security council. It's either you allow us uh, to be part of the security council or you don't <laughs> get to make, you know, decisions here. Now, it seems that they're really weak. But Africa is the fastest growing continent. Um, Africa is uh, probably the best place today in which you have opportunities for resources and allocations. And I think that someone will see that. What I'm saying is that thinking the power structures that, are, that we agree that are not relevant will not collapse, that's irrational. Uh, I, in the end, if it doesn't have... Uh, you know, a good explanation why you don't have any Central or South American country in the Security Council. This is just preposterous. And, 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 and you cannot run the world like that. And if you, you have a world in which you have international travel of millions of people every hour, or, and you don't have the WHO with an authority to ask for information, and to sanction those who do not give it information. It's not sustainable. Now, uh, I'm not saying it will collapse tomorrow morning, but what I'm fearing, and I write this in the book, we should always fear what we do not discuss. And what we, know, we do not discuss is the prospect of another great war. We do not do that because the Cold War is ended. So for a generation now, more than a generation, we don't think about another great war. And we should know that after everything is said and done, you know, uh, pandemics and quarrels about the ICC, the biggest threat uh, is, is another world war. And, and in order to, to tackle that, we need to have power structures, international institutions that are simply relevant to the crisis that we have. And if we don't have them, like you say, and if countries will not give them power, uh, first of all, you're right. We, we, you know, it won't happen without countries giving them legitimacy and power. But the meaning of that would be catastrophic for for our children, and I, you and me know that we are not headed the right way. For years and years now, it's very apparent that the world is. It, you know, is going really, I don't want to say off the cliff, but if you look at almost every kind of parameter, you know, is democracy rising? No, it's not. What's happening with climate change? Is it tackled? No. What about biodiversity crisis, which is becoming even better, bigger, you know, the biodiversity crisis? What about the connections between East and West? What's happening with the rivalry between China and the US? But economies, Western economies did uh, have a good decade. Yes, Western economies had a good decade. Uh, an inequality uh, grew. Which isn't bad for everyone. It depends on your political point of view. But... And of course, if you're up and down in the society. On one end, you are at. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to, ha to end with a happy note, uh, Israel is probably one of the best places to be right now when it comes to COVID, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes and no. Of course, yes, because you'll get a vaccine here. People will actually beg you to get a vaccine and not just any vaccine. But Some people are talking about forcing you. To yes. Get uh, I, so no problem. You know, people I know people in the US, uh, 70 year old, just still waiting for, for a vaccine. And in this country, 
you know, we were really begging 25 year old to take the, the vaccine. So that's great. And, and they're working. <laughs> and, and, and they are working and I'm publishing the data that says that they are working. I should say that I respect and of course trust that data because it's, it's coming from renowned scientists. I cannot measure it myself to quality, but I would like to see, you know, how it influences our mortality and the levels of the disease much more than I've seen until now. And I'm saying this gently because we still have many people, you know, in hospitals and we're still in the midst of an outbreak. And that's the second point. No, because the best place to be is, of course, in places that you don't have a lot of disease and they don't need to vaccinate in such a huge operation during an outbreak. And there are many countries like that. We simply don't talk about these countries. But I'm not talking about only Finland and Iceland and Denmark and Taiwan, and South Korea and Japan. And I can go on. New Zealand. And New Zealand, of course, and Australia. So I, I, if, you, if I had to choose between being in a country with a huge outbreak uh, we're seeing in Israel, but it has the means to vaccinate at the rate it does, and being in a country that says, huh, I can keep you know, infection rates really low, and I know how to do that, and I have the trust of my public, and I'm going to wait and see with the vaccination operation from other places and study what's happening there, uh, how to do it better, you know. Only time means money. Time, if you failed at the, at the beginning, I don't want to say it's a poor man's choice what we're doing right now, because it isn't. But at the end, it is not the A-list uh, of countries. The A-list of countries here, and this is not two countries, it's not only Taiwan and New Zealand. The A-list of countries know how to limit the spread of the disease to an extent that they will have relatively normal life and they do not need to vaccinate so <coughs> quickly uh, the way you do. In the end, vaccination is an intervention. It's a pharmaceutical intervention. And if you can delay it, or you, if you can find other ways to do it, I would rather be in these countries. Now, some would say, no, but you're here in Israel, you know, you deal with that. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to have our healthcare system Israel has really a tremendous healthcare system, and I'm so happy that people around the world know that because of the vaccination attempt. I've been, I, I've known that for many years now. After living in the UK, uh, the NHS is is a is a good healthcare provider, a public healthcare provider, but it's nothing uh, compared to the Israeli healthcare system. That's the truth, you know. Having lived in both places, uh, the healthcare system in this country is just great, and I, I feel tremendously lucky to have the vaccine on the one hand and on the other hand i'm really worried about having the vaccine during an outbreak i think it had it might have you know certain results which one might be not uncalled for okay okay i wanted it to be optimistic but uh well <laughs> at least we tried I, I, they bring me in order to uh so, you know uplift parties <laughs> I'm, I'm usually brought for that <laughs> okay so the book it's yes. called revolt the worldwide uprising against globalization by nadav eyal amazon book depository look for it online it's not that it's not that hard nowadays yes, kindle Search for it highly recommended uh also, also on audible oh ah, did okay. you read it on audible like can did, did i did you, you read you the voice oh no 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 i'm not the voice i'm not oh. the voice for anyone worried benedict <laughs> cumberbatch uh, no, no. No, mm. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah. he's um, uh, the person doing it is, uh, is a talented. really good, very good name. And he's reading nice. it tremendously well. And I really recommend that. This is the way I sort of read most books these also days. Also, President Clinton, we didn't talk about, but he read the book. Yeah, he read the book and he even supplied uh, his uh, blurb to the book. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and also you're on social media, right? Yeah. Where can people find you? On Twitter, it's... Um, Nadav Eyal, they can probably find me quite easily there. If they just Sometimes Google English Nadav tweets also. Yes, yes, yes. I <coughs> talk a lot about COVID-19 also in comparison to the world. Uh, TikTok? 
No, not yet. Snapchat, okay. No, not yet. <laughs> Working on it. Clubhouse. Okay. Well, well, maybe soon. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm considering it, but I don't own an iPhone. Mm. Ah. <laughs> okay, as you shouldn't. Yeah, no, I, sh- I really shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, before we go, um, yes. the the episode, guys, sponsored by Masa Israel Journey, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning. You got to check them out. MasaIsrael dot org slash two nice Jewish boys spelled out T W O nice Jewish boys. Masa Israel Journey has great opportunities. Uh, for internships uh, in Israel, check them out. You can do them even remotely, and you get funding. MasaIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys. Also, we are yes. collaborating with The Forward. Forward.com. Go to forward.com slash 2NJB, guys, and you get a special discount just for 2NJB listeners. Yes. You get six months for 15 bucks. The Forward has great news, great opinion articles, all through a Jewish lens. Also, Otsheva, uh, IsraelNationalNews.com. Check them out for the Israeli perspective in English about current events. And last yes. but not least, the Australian Jewish News, AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com. We talked about Australia. So, yes, yes. Check yeah. them out. AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com. And, of course, lastly, we do this on our free time, guys. So if you want to help us out, go to 2NJB.com slash donate. That's it. Thank you so much, Nadav. Thank you so much, Nadav. Thank you, guys. It was my pleasure being here. Bye. Bye.